Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome finally back to another video. I really want to apologize for not uploading as frequently as I normally do. My usual goal was about one video a week. Um, however, unfortunately, that has not happened lately in the past two months, as you guys can see. But hopefully with this video, I can uh, let you guys know that I'm still here, still alive, still doing well. Um, but the reason I haven't been active is because I haven't been active on YouTube, but on Twitch. So uh, yeah, we're about 800 followers strong, currently hoping to reach 1k very soon. And uh, I've been streaming pretty much four days a week now um, for the past month or so, month, two months, one to two months, um, about as much time as I done my last video. That explains that. So I'm going to be way more active on Twitch. And obviously all the links will be in the description. If you do come from my YouTube channel and don't know me via the Twitch or via my streaming, um, let me know that you came from my YouTube channel because that would be pretty cool to know. So yeah, hope to see you guys on my stream and uh, until next time, let's get right into the video. Alright guys, we are here in PFPX. Now for most of you, um, you guys probably use SimBrief or uh, yeah, pretty much only SimBrief. Um, so that's free and it pretty much does everything you want it to do. So honestly, there's no reason to not use uh, SimBrief here because I love using PFPX and I'm used to it um, for years now. Um, I stuck with PFPX and for those who do use PFPX and are like, how did you get a 300 uh, profile? Just simply go to aircraft database. Um, if you want to add a new one, obviously add a new aircraft and there will be an A300 variant. Uh, it's even a freighter, uh, which is great. The only thing about this is a 200 variant and there's no P Pratt & Whitney variant to choose from. Um, I'd also tried looking on looking up online to see if there's anything there, but honestly, I didn't find anything at the time of this recording. So I do apologize for that, but this should work perfectly fine. The, the differences between the engines performance wise are not that significant. Um, so you don't have to worry about it too much. And on the, since we are running the 200 profile here, but we're flying at 600, even that is not a big difference when it comes to weight. The only thing you need to do is you want to verify that all these weights correspond to what any builds have provided and that's pretty much the only edits you need to do. So if you look at my edits here you can see empty weight, max zero free weight, all that, all this information has been updated to work with the any builds. And because it's an Airbus I am used to using Airbus with kilograms so I always have everything set to the metric system except for altitude of course because altitude is generally in feet. Um, but yeah this is pretty much all I've done for it to make it work with my uh, any builds version and that's pretty simple we'll go to flight here and I'm going to show you guys how I do my flight planning um, very simple really fast honestly um, there's nothing much if you guys watch my streams you'll see me do this occasionally so by that time you guys should already know how to do this but because this is on the YouTube channel of course it's a little bit different um, so obviously I want to make sure that my nav data nav database is up to date which updated today uh, whether um, I have and tracks or I have. So these are these two um, right here are provided by a subscription with PFPX that you have to purchase every year. It costs about 13 euros per year. Um, so that's that's maybe the negative side or negative down or the downside to PFPX that you do have to pay a monthly or a yearly subscription, like kind of like in uh, uh, Navigraph. So flight number today, we're going to use um, DHL, which is Eurotrans, and that translates over to Bravo Charlie Sierra. And uh, if you guys know me th through stream, you know that I use triple two as my standard number. Today we are flying from Echo Golf November X-Ray to Leipzig. This is a real world route. So um, if, yeah, you'll see that I don't have any Orbex or any pay or scenery for uh, Midlands simply because, or East Midlands, simply because I can't afford it right now. Um, Budget is a bit tight. Otherwise, you would have seen scenery, but you you will see scenery at Leipzig. So checking the weather, I, I just simply check the weather, see what the winds are like, and if they do, um, whichever runway they accept or are acceptable for, I use. So runway two seven is fine. I'm going to use runway eight left for arrival today. A three hundred obviously is going to be checked. We don't need step climb and cruise. I like to cruise at around Mach point eight zero. Payload, um, just do a random payload and. Edit anything you like. You like to edit whole time um, with such a short flight, uh, 30 minutes, and because we're flying in the EU, I'm gonna use EU Ops. Then I like to have the map open here and go to Route and simply find a route, which is a great feature here of PFX. And I'll make sure that everything I've entered here is looks good um, because sometimes, as you can see, especially in Europe, you can see how it messes up sometimes. 
the arrivals or the departures for the runway. And so it's very simple, just click on edit and you can just simply choose the arrival that you really want. Um, in this case, I think I want, yes, I want got one echo arrival. So I think I could, no, never mind, I can't do that. Yeah, no, I don't want to do that. Um, yeah, we'll use the one echo and then we'll apply the changes and you'll see the changes will be applied. For alternates, um, we'll just click find and it'll find you the, uh, all the alternates and whichever one is the shortest alternate, which in this case is Echo Delta Alpha Charlie will become your main alternate for the, fl uh, for the uh, flight. You can also see there's an en route alternate as well. Just compute the fl uh, flight. I double check the OFP, making sure that the flight level isn't too low because sometimes PFX does um, give you very low, uh, very low flight levels. That's because of the restrictions um, throughout the route. So uh, you can edit that. Of course, you can force it to go to a different altitude. Everything looks good here. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the flight. And once that's done, I, I would validate that. I would uh, ex actually, sorry, release it. So now it's released. I would save this flight plan to my, you see I've done this, done similar flights in the past already. I would save this flight um, or my, this OFP, send it to Vatsum if, if I were to fly off on Vatsum. And then I would export it by, uh, to explain and all that good stuff. Anyways, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, you can export that to explain files or whatever files you need for the routing of the aircraft and uh, that's pretty much all i do for flight planning and so yeah let's go right into the next procedure um, we're gonna this tutorial is gonna cover pretty much everything from cold and dark up to startup and then obviously all the way down to shutdown so we're gonna go through the entire process as realistic as possible that's the key here um, my tutorials, if I do, do do tutorials, I don't want, I don't like, um, just telling you how to use the airplane, uh, meaning just because of how it works for me, I like to do it realistically, meaning I read the FCOM and make sure all the values or all the information that I have is accurate. And then I'm going to translate that over to the sum. So we're going to go over pretty much every procedure, like a real plane or real airport, uh, excuse me, real pilot would do in the real A300. And uh, we're going to hopefully get you pretty much get or will let you get to know the aircraft at a much deeper level than most people would know. So if you're into uh, realistic procedures, uh, realistic SOPs, this is the channel for you 100%. So the real quick thing that I want to show as well is how I do my charts planning. Um, I'm going to, I think you will see me do some charts here and there. Um, if I do get things edited perfectly and correctly. So, Simply, um, if you have exported the flight plan correctly, I use P3D version 5 files. You can use any files, I think, that it supports Navigraph or is supported by Navigraph, which I think even our explained files. Honestly, I've never tried it out. I'm sure most of you can confirm or deny if it works or not. So, um, we're going to choose our route today, which is Echo Golf November X-Ray 2, Echo Delta Delta Papa. Very simply, choose it and you can see that the root has been made. I really don't have to give a tutorial on this because I'm sure most of you who have this already know how to work it out. Um, what I'd like to do um, to be as realistic as possible, of course, um, although I'm not very sufficient when it comes to this either because I'm not a real pilot, so I don't know everything about planning for a flight, but this is what I do uh, and try to be as realistic as possible. So obviously you want to have the airport. Uh, you want to read through some of the airport information, some of the notams that are given. I like to also have uh, have some of the car uh, stands and coordinates, um, especially for the procedure here that we're going to be covering. Although I don't think the A300 at this current stage, which is version 1.03, um, is capable of changing your coordinates on the in the FMS. Um, we will, however, um, I will, however, mention that at the at, at a certain time where you should be doing it and how to do it. So uh, having a uh, chart with the coordinates of your of your uh, of your stand is also a good idea. Again, reading through all of the uh, briefings. So for example, noise abatement procedures is a good place to start. Um, seeing if there are any specific noise abatement procedures. Usually most noise abatement procedures are, um, are only based off of specific times. But here you can see takeoff to 1500, takeoff power V speed at plus 10. Um, etc. etc. It looks like of, uh, according to
According to this chart right here, it looks like it's going to be a noise abatement departure procedure one, which means um, accelerate at 1500, excuse me, not accelerate, a set uh, climb thrust at 1500 feet and then start to accelerate at 3000 feet. Noise abatement departure procedure two would be um, setting climb power and uh, accelerating at 1500 feet. That is above ground, so AGL. Um, we're going to pin this just to not forget about that. And if there's anything else, general stuff that we want to look up, noise abatement again here. Um, a run up test, reverse thrust, the way they want to use reverse thrust. Um, auxiliary power unit, all that good jazz. If you want to know all about the airport at that time, you can go ahead and do so. The next thing I would do obviously is check charts, uh, I mean SIDS. So today's SID is Delta Tango Yankee, which is Daventry 3 November. I'm going to quickly give a quick glance because we're going to look at this later. Transition altitude to 6,000. Initial climb looks like it's going to be probably 9, nine or 0. Um, yeah, it looks like it's going to be 9 or 0 according to our... Oh, there we go. Never mind. Here it says, warning, do not climb above flight level 70 until clear by ATC. So we, there we have it. 70 is our initial climb. Um, so we're going to... Uh, we already pinned that. And in case we have to come around or come back... Um, because we're departing runway 27, we can also expect to arrive in runway 27 in case we do need to come back. So I'm going to pin runway 27 as our arrival, just in case we do have to return to the airfield. Go out of that, go to uh, our next, uh, to our arrival, of course, and then get, do the same stuff. Now, according, if you want to wait until you actually start to plan for your descent, obviously you can wait till then. I like to get it out of the way, so I'm just going to quickly pin all of the information that I'm planning on Eating. Uh, yep, we'll take this. Don't need the INS coordinates for the arrival since we're not going to realign the um, aircraft. And uh, that's pretty much all we need for this right here. So the star, the ILS, and, or whatever approach you're planning on, and then the airport and maybe stands as well. That's pretty much all you have to do for uh, Navigraph. Or you don't have to do this, obviously. This is all, all up to you. Everybody plans their charts as they wish. But this is what I do in case you guys like to have some inspiration we are now here in the any builds a300 uh, service from east midlands over to uh, leipzig as we have planned earlier hope you guys it wasn't a waste for you but if you uh, obviously did skip it i don't feel uh, it's all good um, i totally understand because i'm sure you guys know exactly how to, what to do with flight planning but again just in case for those who um, like some kind of inspiration from a different person or would like to see what other other people do um, for example me um, that's what i made that for um if you guys wonder what because I, I think on stream i get this question quite a bit is what the clouds are i use fs enhancer 0 0.6.3 which in general i think is a very performance intensive uh lua script and all that um but it looked absolutely gorgeous at least i think so right now it looks really gorgeous Let's switch over here to my controls for those who also would like to know what kind of controls i use i use a I use a completely different, um, basically its own profile, and these are the response curves I have so far. Um, I'm still testing them. I think the roll response curve that I made is pretty good. Um, the pitch is a bit finicky. It's a bit weird for me, um, but I like to have it around there. So you guys can copy that if you want. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have with the buttons. I don't really have much with the buttons. I didn't edit anything yet. Um, I do want to get buttons configured for the auto throttle disengage as well as the autopilot disengage but for now I haven't done that yet because I haven't gone through the time to actually do it but once you do it you don't have to do it again which is nice so I want to make sure to do that very soon so this tutorial this part one at least will cover the entire startup uh, until before pushback and with that I mean around five minutes before pushback so um, we won't be starting the APU with this flight or this uh, this part we'll be starting it uh, next part and that's when we'll be pushing back and uh, getting ready to depart. And we'll do the departure as well, the climb out, and then uh, part three will be the descent and the landing and the shutdown and all that good jazz. So as it looks, it's going to be a three-part series. And this is probably going to be the most extensive uh, part, probably an hour long. I don't know how long. We'll see how long it will be. Hopefully I won't drag it out too much like I am right now. So let's get right into it. If it is laggy for you a little bit, I do want to apologize. Again, I'm running in 4K. It's the first time I'm actually recording in 4K. And so hopefully with the few tests that I've done, it looks pretty smooth. Um, 
most of the time, like 90% of the time, and so I hope it looks smooth for this tutorial as well. So, um, we're going to start actually with the outside. Now, most of you would probably never do this. Even I never do this really. But for this airplane, I do decide to, you know what, let's go the extra mile and we'll see. And we'll uh, actually try to do things a bit different than what I normally do. So, um, we're going to do an initial exterior inspection or also called the safety exterior inspection. This is done normally right before you uh, enter the airplane. Just to have a quick overview of the airplane. Um, there are four things that you want to check. Um, so don't worry, it's nothing extensive, nothing we're really looking into. And these four things are the nose uh, or the the nose wheel trucks are in place, which we'll do that in just a second. So let's do that now. Let's, con uh, let's connect a few ground services here. We'll go to ground ops, go to ground services, and then we'll connect the trucks and the external power as well. So we're going to connect both here. And uh, you should see a 3D model of, in fact, I think they model both, which is nice, and cones, I think. So you see the GPU here, although I don't know if that's actually a default CPU, a GPU, or if that's actually from, honestly, I can't, I don't know. I think it is for the IndieBuilds. If it is, I hope IndieBuilds actually make an integration where you can actually see the cable go into the airplane. That'd be cool addition, hopefully soon. And then you can also see the uh, trucks are now in place. Um, both the main landing gear as well as the nose gear have trucks. That's the first thing we want to check. External power we want to check is uh, connected, which it is. And then we want to check the landing gear doors. Um, th the reason why we check this is because in the pre-flight procedures, there is a check for the hydraulics. So we want to make sure that the that the doors, the gear doors are all in their position or respective position, meaning the position that they should be in. Um, obviously, if there are doors open up here, um, that's obviously not what we want. Um, which means that if we do need to do a, uh, if we if they were extended, uh, we would have to pressurize the hydraulics. Again, we're just making sure that that, that is not the case. Um, the next thing would be the APU area. So sometimes it is possible that obviously with this big plane, it's very rare, but it is possible that the APU could be sitting at a terminal or at a uh, at a uh, something that's blocking the APU so or the blocking the APU, APU exhaust. So if we were to start the APU, it could damage anything that's behind it, and that's why we want to make sure that the APU area is clear. Those are the four things that we checked, or th maybe even three for some of you, or maybe even two things, depending if you want to consider the chocks and the GPU. But chocks and GPU are definitely important to have early stages, so we know that they're there. And landing gear, gear doors is also a very important thing. With that, we go into the cockpit. So um, obviously some of you realists would say open the doors first before you enter the cockpit or the flight deck for most of us. So you can easily do that. We'll go to the ground services. We'll go to uh, air stairs, connect those, and we'll connect the, or get, get the uh, loader going. As well as the fuel truck. And um, what time, what, not, not what time, what's the temperature to here today? Um, the temperature here is going to, or is, not going to be, is uh, 19 degrees. Okay, it's not too bad. Um, you know what? Uh, with 90 degrees, I think we're f quite happy to keep the AC unit off. So we're going to keep it off for now. Um, but that procedure is going to be covered. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll cover it in a second. But uh, yeah, um, what you should do when you connect the AC unit. There is a little procedure that you should uh, be wary of. Um, and this, is, this actually goes for pretty much every Airbus. So we'll get to that in a second. So those are all checked. And with that connecting, which is a nice little feature of any builds here, is that when you connect these things, the doors actually m automatically open which is a nice little touch. And they, I think the cargo door at least closes automatically once the 3D animation is completed with its loading process. I will say um, the loading process is a nice touch, but I wish they would have fine-tuned it a little bit to make the car drive forward and not the actual carts go forward. Uh, that's a little nitpick thing that I've done. And make sure, and hopefully in the future, they'll have real-time loading implemented. If they don't already, I don't think they have uh, do. But if they do, um, having real-time loading. So once you hit, like, you can enter your values, you hit load, and then it will load real-time the cargo as well as the fuel. That'd be pretty cool to do. But overall, this is a great start, and I'm really excited. Um, really, I'm not necessarily excited, but really happy that this plane is at its current level. Um, there are improvements that we will get to in this tutorial since some of the, some of the procedures required to do certain things, but they are not covered in this airplane. But we'll go over it. So... Next will be the preliminary cockpit preparation. This is done by the pilot not flying. So most of, most of the time, the pilot not flying would be the person to enter the cockpit first, and he or she would do their flows. Now, that includes ignition, 
Make sure that is switch, switch to off. Wipers off for obvious reasons. Thrust levers idle. Um, the reversers are stowed. Um, so that's double checked right now with my physical levers that I have. Uh, fuel high pressure valves. So that's these fuel levers here are off, which they are. Landing gear, make sure that's down. At least the physical handle is down. And then the rear and overhead circuit breakers, which are not modeled, you want to make sure that every circuit breaker is pushed in. If there wasn't any circuit breaker, or if a circuit breaker would not be in the position that it should be, obviously you would have to contact maintenance and ask them why that is the case and if it's something that the MEL actually allows. Next thing, you want to do, uh, check the batteries. So first things first, before applying battery or uh, DC, uh, DC uh, power, so DC voltage, is we want to make sure that the batteries are off first and we need to make sure that the batteries have sufficient voltage just like with every other plane. So we go to battery one, which we already are on DC meters. We want to make sure that the voltage is at, is at least at 25 volts or obviously in the within the white range. Um, we want to check all three batteries and if, if, if at least one battery is not at 25 volts, you must consider using the GPU, so the external power, and you must not start the APU. And we're going to do that anyways. Um, starting the APU at this time is unrealistic, and uh, um, for those who just for those who are watching this tutorial, obviously are here for realism and not for um, and not for getting into the air as quick as possible. I would recommend other tutorials for that. Once that is checked, we can select all three batteries to the norm position. And want to verify that the uh, flow bars, which is what these lights are called, are all illuminated for all three batteries. But once the batteries are all on, we want to do a few checks before continuing. Uh, we want to make sure that the AC emergency on inverter light, which is a blue light here, is on. And then obviously you want to make sure also that the DC essential on bat light is illuminated. Next, we want to go up here and now we check the AC uh, indications. We want to go to um, the emergency. Um, and this is where the first thing that the air, that the any builds have not simulated quite yet, um, or at least not 100%, hopefully they will soon, is you would want to verify that if you're on the emergency bus or uh, yeah, the AC emergency bus that you get, you actually have a voltage and a frequency. Everything in the white ranges is what is being looked at. So um, in this case, they did not simulate that. So um, again, so maybe in the future version in one point, whatever it is, cause this is currently version 1.03, it is not simulated. But again, if it was, go to emergency and make sure that the voltage and the frequency are checked. So if now this is probably just simulation problems, not real, not actual issues with the aircraft. Um, if this would fail, meaning that if the AC emergency bus is actually not powered, which in this case it isn't, but again, I think that's just a simulation error um, or a simulation, um, like just a, just a lack of simulation, not because of the airplane is broken, because I've had this every flight. Um, you would actually want to um, turn off the batteries and then apply any external power or APU after that, because um, that could uh, additionally damage the batteries or any other components. Um, if keeping the batteries on. Don't ask me why, that's just what the FCOM says. <laughs> um, which is another good point. Everything I do is based off the FCOM, nothing that I'm making up. Next, we want to verify the hydraulics. So if the gear doors were open um, that we checked earlier on the outside, we would want to contact ground and let them know uh, or ask them if there's anybody working on them right now. And if they weren't, we would uh, pressurize the, the green electric hydraulic pumps and those should... Um, then bring the gear doors back up and then you would turn it back off. But because we don't have to do that, um, everything's fine there. Next is the APU fire test. So if you did want to start the APU, which is again, not realistic in these days, um, you'd obviously have, want to do the APU fire test prior to that. So check the agent, you click the agent test button and you want to make sure that the squib light illuminates. And then we do the same thing here, but with the loop. So you'll see when we press this, that loop A will illuminate. And then a few seconds later, loop B with the fire handle should illuminate. And you'll hear the uh, oral morning as well. If that's checked, go ahead and let go. And you'll once the uh, caution comes back up, which is right there, just clear it out. And uh, the, the loop B indication should also clear out. There we go. AP fire test is complete. For doing the AP fire test, you would actually connect AC power. Um, so let's go and select the external power on, and then you'll see the aircraft come to life. Now, once we've got the external power connected or any AC power connected, 
we now do the standby generator test. So if you're flying a fruit that is long enough to require ETOM, so flying over an ocean or um, or not having access to land for a long time, again, if you require ETOMs, which SimBrief I think does do, and PFX definitely does do, um, this is the, a check you would do um, next. So now we want to make sure, so again, that's why we're checking these things. We want to make sure that we're now electrically supplied, which we are. And um, if the APU is not running, make sure that the APU switch is switched to off. Want to make sure that the bat flows valves are extinguished or have been extinguished in the past, which they were. They just all were. We would now want to contact ground, letting them know, hey, we're about to pressurize the hydraulics anyways. Um, and once we do that um, and we have the clearance, we would do so. So electric, uh, the green electric hydraulic pump turns on and we want to verify that the low pressure light extinguishes which it does, and then we want to make sure that the PTUs are off, which they are. Fuel pumps need to be all off, on which they all are. And uh, we now go to standby generator, which is right here, open the guard and select um, the switch to override. As soon as you switch it to override, you have, at least in the real plane, you have about two minutes. Now I didn't test this in this airplane, but you have around two minutes until this um, the override gets overrided again. And so the test um, will not be able to be conducted anymore. So that is set to override. And once that is done, you now do the actual checks that we need to check. So first thing is we want to make sure that the standby gen fault light, which is above here, is extinguished, which it is. You can, for obvious reasons, you don't want to have that illuminated. We then go to the, um, the DC uh, meter. You want to go to a central bus. And you want to verify that your amperage is close to zero. You then Want to verify that you have around 22 to 29 volts DC, which it is. It's in the, nine, uh, in the white arc. We then go to the essential bus on the AC panel, and you want to verify that you have around 110 to 120 volts AC and around 400. So again, again, everything in the white ranges. So you want to make sure you have everything in the white ranges there. And if you do, all you have to do is want to uh, turn off the electric pump once again. And you can then off the uh, standby generator or switch it to auto and then put it back to guard. And that's the check there. So that's all you really do. And that is the standby power or standby generator test. Now you would select your cockpit lights as you desire. So if uh, you have any, if it's nighttime or whatever it is and you want to adjust your lighting, go ahead and do that now. And you want to verify that in your electrical panel, which is this entire panel right here, that there are no fault lights except for the two generators. So I'm going to switch. I don't know. This is a little bug um, with the any builds right now. Like the the button is like half pressed in. Um, so just press it in. And you'll see that the fault light illuminates. So these are the only two fault lights you should be able to see on the electrical panel. So that's checked as well. Next, another um, recommendation. Now, this is something you don't have to do, but a recommendation according to the AFCOM is turning on the left uh, inner fuel pump 2 on um, during refueling. And uh, this um, this uh, is turned on for less refueling time. It actually helps with the refueling according to the AFCOM. Don't ask me how. Um, it makes sense, but again, don't ask me about the details. That's just what the AFCOM says. So I'm going to turn that on um, to increase or uh, to increase the or to decrease the refueling time um, obviously I don't think for such a short flight and with such little fuel for this flight we wouldn't really need to do this but just um, for exp explanation's sake I'm gonna do it go ahead and do it anyways want to make sure that the probe and window heat at this time is off um, ventilation want to make sure all white lights are extinguished and you want to make sure that the uh, that the on the ground overboard green flow is in line which it is We'll now do a, a enunciator test so set this to um, test and you should actually hear the wind shear warning which you do and you obviously want to check all the lights make sure they're all there as well which is i guess there's a little graphical glitch right there um that's okay seeing if there's anything uh, any other graphical glitch maybe that i can report to any bills to make the airplane a better plane there we go that's checked and uh, everything looked good. Next we'll go to the air bleed system. If the APU would be running at this point, you can turn on the APU bleed. Um, and then here's where one thing we want to check. So if we are using the air conditioning cart, um, this is where we get to that. You want to make sure that the packs are off for that, for the operation of it. 
This is to prevent uh, any leakage or any uh, any uh, kind of uh, liquid leakage from the AC unit into the pack system. Um, so yeah, you would want to make sure those are off. Um, but because we're not using the AC unit, we're going to keep them on, and usually the fault lights are completely normal. And we'll go ahead and set uh, you can set the temperature selectors as desired. I'm going to set that to CRT. Parking brake. Verify is on, and you'll see that the pressure, you want to verify the pressure is at around 1500 PSI, um, which it is now. I think it's exactly at 1500 PSI, actually, so that's perfect. Um, yeah, so you want to make sure that with the parking brake that both um, pedals are at 1500 PSI, and uh, that is the case. So parking brakes are working. The next check is the alternate system check. Now, I honestly don't think this works uh, in this plane yet. I know it hasn't worked in 1.02 and earlier, um, but I don't think they fixed it in this either. Otherwise, they would have mentioned it. But I'm going to show you guys how to test it anyways. So you want to verify that the chocks are in place, which they are for us. Um, then you would sit, switch the brake and anti-skid system to alternate on. Meaning we're now using the alternate braking system. Disengage the parking brake and you should see the pressure deplete. Um, once it's depleted, you would now press your pedals to the full pressure detent, which you can see the animation doesn't even work. I'm pressing my pedals in and out right now, but you don't see them actually animate. Maybe that's an issue. Um, well, I mean, that's definitely one issue. Maybe there's another issue here with... Uh, I mean, there is another issue here with the actual acupressure. So if you do press the pedals to their full detent, you should see around a pressure increase of the brakes between 2000, which is around here, and 2700, which I believe is this white mark here. So you want to see a pressure between these two little lines here if you do do a full pedal press. But again, I said, like I said, currently in version 1.03, this system is not accurately uh, modeled. So once uh, that is done, release your uh, pedals, apply the parking brake, and switch this back to norm on. So that would be the alternate braking check. Next, you want to verify the speed brakes is set to the position as the outside. This is another check that, he, that we would do in the outside exterior inspection. You want to check your flaps position, your spoiler uh, position, and you would want to set the both handles, so the slats and flaps handle, as well as the spoiler lever, both to those detents to make sure that it, whenever the hydraulics are pressurized that they don't auto, uh, automatically move or accidentally move when they shouldn't be moved, if that makes sense. So you want to make sure that these two handles are set to the actual outside uh, position of the flaps, slats, and uh, spoilers. Um, there would be another thing, a few things we would do. We would go to the maintenance panel right here. Um, in fact, here to the radio panel, but this is not simulated. You want to set PA to the uh, to receiving and to the 12 o'clock position. Um, but that's not simulated right now, so we're going to ignore it. As well as check the emergency equipment and the rain repellent pressure and quantities but those two things obviously we can't really check in the sim and rain repellent is not simulated either so no need to do that once that is complete that is the preliminary cockpit preparation completed and we're going to go right here into the fp and we're going to load up the fuel first i'm going to go and load the load up the fuel right now you can do it via the load sheet or the load manager but i'm going to do it via the load manager and in fact the fuel page is actually the first page um, that we need to interact with. According to our OFP, so if we check our OFP right here, um, give me just one quick second. If we check the OFP here, um, it's giving us, um, again, we want to make sure that we're in kilograms and the airplane is set to kilograms, which it is, and then we'll set, you can see here the release is 16.3 tons. And so that's what we're going to go ahead and enter. So 16.3, just I'm going to set 16.4, and I'm going to select load fuel. Um, I think it does it instantly currently, which it does, yeah. And so that's fine. I hope again in the future uh, that will be changed to real time. That would be pretty cool. It would be a cool feature. It's not necessary, but it would be pretty cool. And we'll go to the next page, and we'll keep it at this page. We'll not, we'll not load that yet. But if you want to, of course, feel free to load everything at once. Uh, next, we now will go to the pre-flight uh, procedures. Um, so the cockpit preparation, this is done by the pilot flying. So everything that we just did was the pilot not flying. Um, so in this case, it would be the co-pilot because we're like, going to be the captain flying today. Um, but now the pilot flying, which is us, um, would actually do the overhead scan. But again, because we're only one man crew, as we know by these, day or these days, um, we do everything. But now the pilot flying would do the 
overhead scan and all the, uh, the all some other stuff also some other stuff um, and the philosophy pretty much um, just like in every Airbus in fact um, so there's some videos out there that I've seen uh, not to call them out but there's some videos that say uh, there's certain things you don't want to turn on but uh, according to the FCOM, uh, this airplane is also a all whites, uh, all white lights, or white light, no white lights of philosophy. Even the fuel pumps, even uh, other systems. So, um, yeah, that's just to let you guys know. So we want to make sure that the gear pins and covers are checked, so they we have them all in here. Again, no physical simulation of that, so no need to worry about it. And our next thing, because we want to get this done as soon as possible, is set the IRS to nav. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the IRS alignment, so we'll set System 1, System 2, and System 3 to nav. You we'll see that the uh, on the sea light illuminates are bat, what's, what's it exactly say? I honestly don't know, bat mode? Or no, it's never mind. I don't know what it exactly says, but we'll do a little self-test, and then we'll set, go to align mode. Once that is checked, we'll go to our FMS. Uh, we're going to clear out the messages here. And the first thing we go are going to do are gonna, is going to set the from and to. Or if you have a company route, you can do the company route as well. Um, so I'm going to do Echo Golf November X-Ray to Echo Delta Delta Papa. Enter that in. We don't have a route. We should have a route. But again, like I said, I don't think I exported it correctly. So we're going to return. Um, and it will say Align IRS. This this should actually only indicate once if um, we are in a different page than the init page, um, which we were. So we're going to clear that message out, and it's telling us to align the IRS. Now, generally speaking, um, like I said, here's where, again, a few procedures are a bit limited. You should be able to, in the real plane, check your latitude and longitude and be able to edit it. So you can see right now that the latitude and longitude don't have these double arrows, the up and down arrows. If you were to select on any of them, so let's say longitude, you'll see that these arrows up, up, um, are shown, which means you can use the slew keys to change the um, longitude in this case. And if you were to press the latitude, uh, you would see that you can now edit the latitude. Um, and uh, currently, this is not simulated. Um, however, you would do this in the real plane. And again, if we check our charts, um, which I have here, give me one second, like we planned earlier. The parking stands. Here we are. So if we were to check our charts, we would uh, check what position gate or gate we are at, and we would then copy the coordinates and paste those in the FMS. And if we look closely, actually, you can see that the coordinates don't even really line up, do they? No, they don't really line up well. But once you align the IRS, you'll see that they're f they'll be fine. But again, that's another limitation or a, 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 I guess somewhat of a bug, because um, not only can you not edit the coordinates, but the coordinates from the get-go are a bit off, which is really strange. So. Uh, keep that in mind, but again, that's something you would do in the real plane. And in case it ever gets simulated, you guys then know what to do. Let's go back to X plane here. And the next thing we would do once our coordinates are updated, we then select the align IRS prompt. And the IRS should now be in the alignment system, uh, in the align, uh, excuse me, alignment status. And you can confirm that by going to status and then just checking every system. You'll see that eight minutes is applied on each system. We're going to go and turn it off. That's also an SOP to turn it off. Uh, there's no need for it anymore. Once that is done, once the initialization is done, we'll now do the overhead scan. So, no smoking is set to auto. Seatbelt sign, um, depending on if you... Now, we're also going to cover c passenger stuff um, because um, this plane will also become a passenger variant soon, or any builds is going to release a passenger variant soon. We're also going to cover passenger ops to cover both fields. Um, Seatbelt signs are kept off if you're still refueling. Um, if, again, if this airplane had real-time refueling, I'm sure we would still be refueling, and so the seatbelt signs would stay off at this time. But because we're done with refueling and it's and it was instant, we're going to go and turn the seatbelt signs on at this time. want to make sure that there are no indications on the cell call, as well as any calls. That would obviously mean we've missed something, but we didn't. And then lights, you can set as you wish. I'm going to go and set this to bright. Uh, reservoir quantities, you want to make sure that's in the green indication, which it is. Um, that's all checked. No white lights. Low pressure lights are all good. No indications here. Um, low pressure lights are normal. No indications otherwise. And everything looks good here. Fault lights are normal. And here we go to the flight recorder. Just like in the Airbus 320 or any pretty much any other Airbus, you want to turn on the uh, voice recorder because the voice recorder will not record anything until 
engine starts, so turning it on manually will actually record everything right from the get-go, at least as soon as we press this button. So you would turn that on, and then uh, this is all checked. Head back down here. You can already see the flow is pretty much every little section of panel, and then from down to up. Strobe lights set to auto. Navigation lights set to system 1 or 2, depending on who's flying. So the captain would use system 1. The co-pilot, if he's the pilot flying, would use system 2. Um, but again, every airline does it differently. So some airlines just keep it on one system, and as soon as that system fails, they would switch to system 2, etc., etc. So again, it depends on what airline uh, you're looking at. But from what I've understood, um, setting system 1 and 2 is... Um, dependent on who's flying the aircraft first or at least for that leg. Anti-ice is very self-explanatory we do not want to have that on um, right now. Uh, ATS, pitch trim and yaw damper systems all come on. This will help us power also the uh, auto flight system. Galley, set this to on, not sure why it should be shed. If it would need to be shed, uh, you'll see an indication um, on the position switch um, that the uh, that the electrical load is too high, and it will, and it will then basically give you or give you an indication that hey, maybe you should consider turning off the galleys. Um, or not, they're not really necessarily going to be turned off completely. They're just going to be reduced in power. Um, but yeah, so as soon as that indicate, so as long as that indication does not exist, you can keep the galleys in the normal position. Here we we already checked pretty much the electrical panel. You don't, you want to make sure that the f there are no fault lights except for the generators and no white lights or no other in no other lights except for the fuel flow uh, not the fuel flow the uh, flow bar lights. Those are normal. Everything else should be off. Now do the uh, engine fire test, which is pretty much the equivalent to the AP fire test, except we have one additional agent. Um, so just do the agent test. So you'll see squib on both agents, and then we do the same thing here. Loop A, loop B after a few seconds with the fire handle and here you can also check the message the master warning and the high pressure valve indication let go and you'll see the loop b still um, stays illuminated so we can cancel that and it should then get rid of it there we go um, check up here um, we don't need to do anything we already checked pretty much everything here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to keep this on battery one and we're going to select this to Gen 1. So as soon as one of the generators... Actually, we're going to keep it on Gen 2 because that's going to be the first engine we're going to start today. Um, and so we're going to set this on Gen 2 once we start the engine. Cockpit door um, indications. In fact, uh, I forgot to mention something. If you do the uh, test, um, I didn't really mention it, but I did check it. Do the uh, enunciator test. You want to make sure that all these lights illuminate, which indicates that the system does work properly. So the... This is especially important for the uh, passenger variant. The cargo variant is not that important, but the passenger variant, obviously, for safety reasons, you want to make sure that the system actually does function. Um, no use, no no reason for high frequency at the moment. So we'll go back down here. Wipers off, APU off, um, everything else is fine. No lights, ignition off, everything is fine. Fuel, you want to check if fueling is complete. Obviously, you want to make sure it's balanced and set correctly. Now here's where we go to um, this panel, the fuel panel. Um, from the AFCOM, what I've read is, again, all white lights are extinguished, so you can go ahead and turn on the fuel pumps once refueling is completed all to normal. Um, again, this is only if refueling is completed. This uh, this procedure applies the same with the seatbelt sign, so as soon as fueling is complete, you can turn the seatbelt sign and the fuel pumps all to normal. Except for the inner tank 2 pump, you can turn that on during refueling as well. Again, another ETOMPS item, if we do... If we are flying ETOMPS routes, um, you would want to check the crossfeed, make sure that switching it uh, to inline works. So you want to make sure that the cross crossfeed uh, valve actually does transit and then switching it back to crossline. Um, that's another ETOMPS thing. Lights, again, set as required. AP fire test we already did. Nothing we need to do here. Here in the landing gear panel, you want to make sure that um, all the lights are illuminated that need to be which are again green lights and you want to cross check these with the actual main indications. Head back up here and do the voice recorder test. Again, you want to verify normal indications, which looks like it is and we can erase the message. Not okay, that, that, that doesn't work. But, okay, I don't know. Um, like in normal Airbus, if you do a CVR test, you would actually hear a little tone because um, uh, I'm more familiar with the A320, but I don't know if that's the same case um, with the A300. Let's head down here. Um, system 1 is fine. You can switch between the systems, um, but the FCOM doesn't state that this is a necessity, um, so that's fine. Again, no white lights, and you want to make sure that this is set to normal. 
and want to make sure that the uh, that the rate uh, indication is extinguished. That's it's the rate light. So if you switch it to high, you see that the rate light illuminates. So you want to make sure that's extinguished. And uh, normal things. So uh, cabin altitude should obviously be the altitude at which we're currently at. So our field elevation, our vertical speed should be zero or close to zero. And same thing with differential pressure should be at zero or close to zero. Uh, window heat and probe heat all to normal. Those can all be turned on and um, cargo smoke detection systems can all come to on as well. Um, don't ask, me, I don't think there is, there w would be a test for this. Um, in the real plane, you wouldn't test this. Um, but if you wanted to, you could, and it does work. Again, go into the f engine fire test, so squib test, and then the loop test, loop A, and then loop B, and then the fire handle. That is checked. And that's checked. There we go, cancel that, and we'll head back up here. And the loop B light should extinguish. There it goes. No white lights, everything is fine here. And the cockpit door is open, which is fine. We don't need this again. Emergency exit lights. Very simple, switches to arm, make sure that the disarm light extinguishes. Um, you can set the t uh, lights as you wish. APU bleed again as you wish, depending if you have the APU running or not, and then, which is checked. Um, in cargo variants, uh, econ flow is always turned on, uh, and this is simply because um, you don't need to have a full uh, pack usage. And this econ flow only applies if you're pretty much in the air. So as soon as, or as soon as you don't use APU bleed, um, econ flow does not apply to APU bleed. It only applies to engine bleed, but we would turn it on anyways because um, you don't have to worry about it later. And what the econ flow indicates, so when to turn this on is, you can turn this on every time in the cargo because this is based off of the passenger variant. So if your passengers, if your passenger count is um, below 68% of the um, entire or if it's only occupied by 68% of the what the aircraft can actually take so for the A200, that would be approximately 168 passengers out of 220. Um, if only 168 passengers are flying on board or less, you can turn on econ flow because the econ flow again only um, or reduces the pack flow from 100%, which is obvious, to 68%. Um, and so that's what how that is determined. If you're using the a passenger variant, you would turn econ flow on at a passenger count of less than 68 percent max cool you would use so you would never use both at the same time i mean you could but you really barely would you'd switch between the two and max cool is used if your uh, sat so your standard air temperature outside is more than 35 degrees and fairly humid so this would obviously cool down the cabin a bit more more efficiently and not necessarily but it would change the norms of the cooling system this is all set as desired um and this is set to crt Everything here is good and no lights, everything looks good and uh, normally I think, uh, according to the FCOM, this should actually be off because the securing checklist actually wants you to turn this off before you shut down the aircraft. So that's another thing that any builds could possibly change and hopefully change for the cold and dark setup that this is switched to off um, um, by default. So you want to make sure that this is switched to um, norm or to on and then you'll make sure that the pressure is actually in the green. I think, honestly, I think that the switches are actually reversed. If you press them in, they should be on, and if you press them out, they should be off. So I think that's a little mistake they've done, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, that's just my assumption. All right, we're gonna put that back up. And that is the overhead scan complete. We can go ahead and load the cargo or the passengers, whatever variant you're running on. So we're gonna select the total here um, to what our load sheet set, or not what our load sheet, sorry, what our uh, OFP says, if we have a quick look, our OFP says 111.80 fuel weight, so we're going to confirm that later in our cargo, or at least our total payload is 21.8. So we're going to go ahead and set 21.8 in the total, so 21.8, and we'll s load that in as well. Go to next, and it will compute your load for you, which we're going to stay on for now. Once that is loaded, we'll go to the FMS, and this is where we'd start planning our FMS. Now here is where a lot of the limitations actually come in with this aircraft. Um, they haven't modeled absolutely everything, which is again, not a big deal, but um, for a lot of people claiming it to be 
very, very highly accurate. The best airplane um, of X plane currently in 1.03. Um, I wouldn't say I would say it's not definitely not the most accurately simulated aircraft. Uh, okay, I wouldn't say it is accurately simulated, but there is still it is not the most complete simulation um, compared to let's say the A320, for example. Um, many people take the A320 um, for granted. People don't understand how detailed the A320 is. And I don't mean just flight factor. I mean uh, in real life too. There's so much going on in the background that even flight factor is simulated that you don't even realize um whereas in a plane like this where it's all manual all kinds of push buttons you actually can notice how detailed it could possibly be because you have to turn on certain switch uh, systems manually whereas in the airbus it would all do it it's uh, ma automatically um I, I mean with the a320 or or old or uh, younger so yeah anyways that's just like a little thing i want to say all right, so first things first, um, we want to go to ref page, go to AC status, and we want to verify that our engine aircraft is, not our engine aircraft, that our aircraft is obviously correct, which it is, and our engine type is active, uh, or correct, and our active database is checked. Um, this is another thing that's not simulated, which again is not a big deal, most of us would not even touch this, but in the real plane, depending on wear and tear, you would change the performance factor um, to most likely plus a value and it entered in there. Um, that just tells the airplane or tells the FMC that this aircraft has a little bit more drag and will use more fuel and so therefore the FMC will actually compensate and calculate that for you and try to calculate as much uh, or as accurate as possible with the fuel fuel usage and stuff and extra fuel and all that good jazz. Uh, this is this value is normally calculated by by the airline so this is this is a given value per aircraft per airline and not necessarily per aircraft meaning per A300 or per uh, um, per aircraft type but more like per really per aircraft because every aircraft has all kinds of different damages if they do or every aircraft has a different age so the performance factor is obviously different for each aircraft next we would go to reference again and we would go to the next page and we would actually go to navades which i don't think yeah no they haven't simulated this as well um, because if you click on Navade or on Waypoint, you'll see that it wants you to do a new Waypoint as if we were to p press Defined, um, which is something they haven't done. I'm sure, I don't think this is a difficult fix. Um, I'm sure it's something that they can implement in the future. But what would what would you what would excuse me what you would do is go to Navades. You would enter a Navade identifier um, um, that that you think is not. Or not that you think, but what the notums say are not in service or out of service and that, that are unreliable. So if you check your uh, OFP with notums, you'll see that all kinds of information is out there, that some VORs um, or NDBs are out of service or don't work, and that's what you would type in. So you would type in the identifier. So, for example, Frankfurt, which is not the case today, but Frankfurt. Um, and it, the page will look totally different, but you would put in Frankfurt and then you would uh, you would see that there's a deselect option on the right here, which I think is LSK for right. And you would put in Frankfurt in there as well and you de deselect it to make sure that the FMS or the MCDU does not select that VOR uh, manually. I mean, automatically for you because it's unreliable in the real world. Um, this is another thing that most of us would not do. I would do that because I'm crazy, but you know. Um, that's another thing that real pilots would do is deselect any unreliable navigates to make sure that the FMS actually does not tune these by the, by itself. But once that is done, once the navigate deselection process is complete, we go back to init and we now fill in the information. If you have a company route, you put in the company route here with a slash and you can put the flight number behind that. Um, this function, I don't think, I think it does work, but I honestly haven't gotten, gotten it to work just yet. Um, I'll have to do some more testing. Uh, we then go down here. Um, if you want to set the alternate, go ahead and set the alternate now. Um, according to our flight plan, it is going to be a, um, Berlin, in fact. And then if you had a route, you could insert it now, um, either via there or put it in here. Obviously, if it doesn't exist via the first page that just popped up here, you wouldn't be able to put in anything there anyways. Cost and X, um, put in as any, any value that you want but I typically go with 40 on this airplane. If it's a long haul, I would probably use 60 to 80. Um, cruise flight level is our next thing here, and um, today's flight will give us flight level 330. Put that in and you'll see flight level 330 is updated. 
and then we put our flight ID, which is basically just our flight uh, number. Um, today it's Eurotrans Triple Two. We also have, um, according to our flight level, we'll also have different temperatures. Um, I can actually put in the temperature right here according to my OFP, and our top of our, our, our temp average top of cruise temperature is going to be. So it gives you a standard value of minus 56, but that's not correct. Um, for us, it's going to be minus 46. And then you put in your tropopause, which again, um, Simbrief does give you tropopause if you collect, uh, so, uh, correct, excuse me, select the correct OFP type. Um, and uh, and today's, today um, is actually 38,800. So you put that in and it should update. Cruise wind. Um, I'm going to put the top of cruise wind because I don't think I have an average one, do I? I do not have an average wind right now that I can put in. Uh, so we're going to put in the uh, top of cruise wind here in this case. So it's going to be 102 at 21. Once that is complete, so all your values are checked and it's entered, go to next page and you want to put in the block fuel in case fueling is completed. You'll see the fuel on board has been calculated for you, but you obviously want to double check that with your fuel panel. Once that is double checked, go ahead and enter it in. I'm used to the decimal point being on the left side. Put that in, and then we also put in the zero fuel weight. So you can choose to put in the zero fuel weight or the takeoff gross weight. Um, putting in either one will calculate the other one, um, normally at least. So don't have to worry about that. Um, what we're going to do for now is we're, we're going to put in the zero fuel weight uh, according to the OFP. And then we're going to simulate getting the load sheet later. Since in a real plane, that would be the case as well. So zero fuel weight one 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 point eight and takeoff gross weight is expected to be one twenty seven point eight. Uh, we're going to keep the CG blank simply because um, this tells me that hey, um, these values here that I put in are estimated values, except for the fuel, of course. But everything else is estimated. That means I need to double check all these values later once I get the load sheet. So this right here is an indicator that hey, I did not completely finish this page. After we have done that. Um, we'll go to the flight plan page, and here's where you can start to plan your flight. Duh. <laughs> so we'll go to uh, your um, departure, and you can select this SID. And we'll go ahead and do that. Today's runway is 27. Make sure to select the runway first. Just like in any Airbus, you would always uh, choose the runway first, and then the SID. And today's SID is the uh, Delta Tango Yankee 3 November. Once that is done, you select the insert key. And you can see that the flight plan has inserted its uh, routes, or sorry, its waypoints for the departure. If your air, uh, if your route has airways, uh, you could enter those in too, and we'll get to that in a second. But our next waypoint, in fact, is a direct to Banto after Delta Tango Yankee. So we just put in Banto, put it over the uh, flight discontinuity, and you'll see that sometimes you'll have the same. Um, uh, same uh, waypoint which is a duplicate name and you just want to verify that your flight plan according to your flight plan that you're choosing the correct one which in cases in, the, in our case is the first one and usually always is as well but don't go don't go by that now we have an airway so there are two ways to enter an airway um, you can either um, either way requires you to select the last waypoint and one of them one way you enter your airways is either by selecting it here so you can enter in the airway, which we'll go ahead and do now. So Papa 155 is our airway, and you go s uh, slash, and you select your go-to waypoint, which for us, for this waypoint, is Sivda. So put that in there, select it in there, and it should load in your airway with all the uh, waypoints for that. In this case, it was just, sorry for, for it being so dark all of a sudden. For our case, it was really just one waypoint, but sometimes, obviously, it's going to be more. Or the other way is going go to select airway, and then here is a nice little automatic system that you can choose from or use and then you can choose from the correct airway. So our next airway is Papa 137 and that goes to Redfa. Again, select the airway here. Um, Lima 620 to Suvox. So now you're probably asking when would you uh, when will would you what would you use and when would you use it for the airways? I'm gonna be 100% honest. It doesn't honestly matter. Um, you can do whatever you prefer. Um, when I notice that a waypoint, uh, like just a little tip that I normally do, if I know that there's a waypoint that has that is like in the 
back end of the alphabet so on the like in the um not the top uh not the top 13 but the, the bottom 13 I, I tend to like to put them in manually um, because that saves me a little bit of more time um, in fact putting it manually actually overall saves you i think a bit a bit more time uh, than putting them in via these the system it depends again it depends um it's all your preference do whatever you like whatever you feel comfortable with whatever you think is cooler i obviously think this feature is really cool um i wish everybody's had a feature like that um throughout but i can see why they did not uh did not continue the support for it and then from there we'll put in the star we'll put got one echo in this case you do not have to uh, select the runway first this is now just a uh just a, um, as you wish and put in the transition insert that and now we have the star implemented as well so you check the flight for discontinuity discontinuities and if there are just simply clear them out if they are to be cleared out if they're meant to be there obviously keep them in because that's when you can expect vectors especially if you're flying on VATSIM um, but everything looks good for me Next thing you want to do is verify the flight plan. So you would go to the um, pressing flight plan, by the way. I'm not sure if this is actually like in the real plane or not, but pressing flight plan will not update your uh, page to the top of the flight plan. And what you want to verify is, of course, the um, that your altitude restraints or maybe even speed restraints are actually all set or constraints are, are all set as they should be for the SID according to your charts. And if they are, then that's perfect and we can continue next you would want to go to the init b page so it's uh, sorry flight plan p b page basically so you're on flight plan select like next page you can see that there are wind there is wind data now this feature um, again is something that is not simulated in this plane yet i hope soon because this is technically a long haul hauler and having wind data is very important for uh for uh top top of descent calculations although this plane does not have a top of descent uh, particularly in the mcdu it does have it on the navigation display um so it still would be very useful to have um i get why they, i don't i think i get why they didn't do it yet but i'm sure they'll, they will and hopefully they actually will so um there is there i will still explain how to enter the winds for the future so if we look at our flight plane here and I'd say we've been going for 55 minutes already and we're not close to done yet. So we'll see if I finish the video or we'll continue. Um, like I said, but for now, um, I'm not going to stop it. So if we're going to go to flight plan here, you can see um, PFX actually gives us um, different waypoints for different winds. Um, this is really all that's important. You really do not have to go through every single waypoint and enter the winds. PFX is smart enough to give you all the waypoints that have significant or um, significant enough changes in the winds according to your flight level um, and we'll even give you the winds um, flight, uh, 2,000 feet above 2,000 feet below same thing with 4,000 feet below and 4,000 feet above um, so flight level 330 is what we're planning with today so what we what you would do and how to program this you can see that currently at Redfa, um our, our temperature is minus 46 which you need to keep in mind and your winds are 132 at 28 the way to enter this into the MCU is putting in your temperature first. So you can see it says temperature here. Um, and, and in the real plane, you would actually see three dashes as well um, coming across the temperature. Um, this is currently not modeled or simulated right now. Um, but what, would, what you would do is go to that waypoint, which is red farm. You would put in your temperature of 46 in our case. Put in the winds, which is 132. And uh, at 28. You would s put it in like this, and then put it in Redfa, and that should work. Um, I'm going to try 46. Maybe that works. Um, but I doubt it. So that doesn't work either. So they haven't simulated that as well. Even putting in winds just by themselves, so 132 at 28 does not work, unfortunately. Um, so you, you can forget this for now until a, a new version actually implements this. But again, just to show you guys how it works... Um, in case it actually does work eventually. Next, uh, once that is complete, we go to secondary flight plan. If and if there are, uh, if there's anything you want to program in the secondary flight plan, you would do it now. And here are many options for secondary flight plan. You can either put in a secondary flight plan in case of a 
route, uh, sorry, not a route change, but a runway change. So if you're exciting a runway change at your destination, so let's say uh, Heathrow, um, and you're not sure what runway is departing, and there's no ADAs online or whatever, and you're you're not sure if it's going to be runway 09 right or 09 left, this is a perfect feature for secondary index or secondary flight plan. And the way to do that, how I would do it, is you would I would copy the active, and you'll see that the flight plan is copied, and you'll make sure that it's on the secondary page. You can then go to uh, your departure, select SID, and then you can uh, select the runway with the according with uh, the actual SID. Um, so, so whenever um, they do change the runway on you, you can simply go to the secondary flight plan and select activate secondary flight plan. And that will do it for you. Uh, so you don't have to go into your flight plan and and do it through there. That's one way of doing it. Uh, to clear the secondary flight plan, just click clear secondary flight plan. Very self-explanatory. And that'll be done. The next uh, variant of this, um, and this is if, if the first version does not apply to you, um, the second version is planning for the turnaround. So in case uh, engine failure or anything else that would require you to return back to your origin, um, this is how you would do it. I would not, uh, I repeat, I would not copy the active. What I would do is I would put it in the completely new route, um, which will help you a lot. And that would be from, because trust me, if you do copy the active, you're not going to be able to delete all the other stuff. There's no way to enter a new destination or anything like that. It's not that I know of. Or you can put in a completely new company route in case you already have a secondary flight plan as a exported route. If this function actually really works, I have no idea, to be honest. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't tested it. But you can put in your from too. So that's what we're going to do today. So in case we have to return to the airfield, we're going to go ahead and select our, um, um, our route, which is obviously going to be from Midlands back to Midlands. So we're going to put that in there. Um, there's no flight plan available for us, so we're going to select return. And then here you can see that our um, route has updated. You can change your cruise level. But we're going to select 5,000 in here. And we're going to go secondary flight plan. You can see that now we have a secondary flight plan. And what I would do is I would go to your um, departure. Now here's a little bug again that they that isn't really correct, I think. Um, so a bug that they need to fix. But if you were to select your departure, you should have SID in here. But currently there's only star, which I think is a bug. So hopefully that gets fixed. So for now, ignore it. But I would just put it, go to a departure, select the departure runway, and then hit insert. So don't don't select a SID, um, and then for the star, just simply select the ILS or equivalent for the runway, ILS 27, and then hit insert, and that should be your secondary flight plan. That's all you really have to do for secondary flight plan. Um, again, different companies do different things. Again. Um, and uh, everybody does a little bit different with the secondary flight plan, but those are two options that I normally do or use. So first one is in case of a, a route or in case of a runway change uh, for departure, I like to plan that in. Or if if I'm very certain, like for this case, it's only one runway, I'm very certain that I'm going to use runway 27 today, um, and I don't think I'm going to use runway 09 today, um, I would use the secondary flight plan as a as a, a planning for the... Uh, as the uh, turnaround or as a returning as the returning route um, usually when you do need to um, uh, in case you do have a mayday or do need to declare a mayday or an emergency um, you're gonna get vectored anyway so having an actual route for it is really not necessary next thing we go to progress page and here's where we want to confirm a few things want to confirm that all these uh, VORs are set to auto. If they are not set to auto, you want to verify that your glare shield here, this uh, VOR nav and ILS selector is set to nav or ILS. This will auto-tune any VORs. If you were to select VOR, um, you can you will be able to manually select your VORs. As you can see here, VOR1 is currently selected manual. You will select the second system to VOR as well, and then the second VOR will also be manual, and you can tune it as well. Um, so that's how you select your VORs manually, but normally the FMS takes over, so selecting nav to or ILS should be able to select this to m automatic, and you'll see if you try to tune it, it should not tune anything at all. Um, there was a bug with 1.02, I believe, where it would actually do, it would actually do it, um, but they fixed that now, which is nice. And the next another thing that you would check is to make sure your cruise level uh, and your optimum level as well as your max level are actually um, sufficient. So if your cruise level was above your max level, that would definitely not work out. 
if your cruise level was slightly above the optimum or if you wanted to or if you decided to hey i would rather go to the optimum until a higher level so less fuel burn necessarily at least especially for longer flights then you could hey let's let's revise our cruise level so this is uh, a little check there but we check double check this in the uh, once we start climbing we'll double check these values later on then again, f uh, this is pretty much SOP with every Airbus. If you do our, um, for in case of a return, you would want to put in your runway um, for the return. So what runway we're expecting to return at. Most uh, most of the time, it's not the same runway that you're departing from, but because this airport only has one runway, um, obviously only one runway is chosen, and that it is our departure runway of 27. So we're going to put in our airport. There we go. Put in your um, <laughs> your departure with the runway number, and you should see a bearing and distance. So you put that in there, and uh, we'll have the bearing and distance. So that's what you do for the uh, progress page, and once that is done, uh, you're pretty much done with the FMS for now until we get the load sheet, and so that's all we'll have to do for now. Um, another thing I would actually consider doing is if there are restrictions, so speed restrictions, go to attack mode, and you can change your um, your uh, climb gradient, uh, gradient to either max climb or econ climb. Uh, same thing here, you can go to econ climb and you can set your constant x uh, your, or econ minimum fuel or minimum time and select any of these pre-selects and it will um, calculate your, uh, your climb performance based on the, what you've set here. But if there is a speed restriction that you need to follow uh, during climb out, you can put that in the tact mode. Um, and, or I think it's tactical mode um, written out and you can put in a speed constraint let's say of 220 in here and it should follow that speed constraint that you put in there um, once it's set it to manage mode until you clear it out it should then set to a sp other different speed depending on what you set it at but that's another additional thing that you um, can do and for now we're going to go back to progress page and we're going to continue with the glare shield scan